Hey friends, how are you doing today? I hope you're feeling blessed and staying in God's presence. And if not, I hope you feel uplifted after today's video. If you're new here, welcome to His Princess Christian Community, where we read a chapter of the Bible every day and then discuss it afterwards and in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow and it opens the door for more people to join our community. And while you're at it, check out the description box. We got a lot of great stuff in there. So today we're reading Hebrews chapter 9, but before we get started, I want to say a prayer if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together here on His Princess Christian Community. Thank you for opening the door for people to join our community, for connecting us and strengthening our bond. Thank you for opening our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to your word. Thank you for your wisdom, understanding, and clarity as we seek to interpret your word. And thank you for the courage to apply it to our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Hebrews chapter 9. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was a second room called the most holy place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark were a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the Ark's cover the place of atonement, but we cannot explain these things in detail now. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year, and he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people, the sins the people had committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that these priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscious, consciences of the people who bring them. For the old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people, so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant. Now when people's when people now, when someone <laughs> leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after that person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssops, branches, and scarlet wool. Then he said, This blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. 
For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Amen. So what did you think of Hebrews chapter 9? I'm interested to hear about it in the comments below. Let me know what your insights or interpretations were on the chapter. Maybe comment your favorite verse or just say hi and let us know that you're part of the community. And if you've been blessed lately, let us know so that we can rejoice with you. And if you need prayer, make sure you're putting that in the comments too so we can pray together as a community. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 9 starts off with the old rules about worship. So if you're familiar with the Old Testament, then this part will make a lot of sense where they go through and talk about the setup of the tabernacle, how there's a first room which has the lampstand, the table, the sacred loaves of bread, and how each of those things, if you read through the Old Testament, each of those things has a particular meaning to them. And it says this room was called the holy place, but then there was a curtain. And behind that curtain was a second room called the most holy place. And when Christ died, that veil, that curtain was torn in two, um, you know, symbolizing the fact that there is no longer a separation between us and God. And then it says that, so then it goes through and it talks about what was actually in the Ark of the Covenant that was in that most holy place and how previously the high priest was only able to enter that room once a year and he had to first sprinkle it with blood to atone for the sins of himself and for the people before he actually entered that room. But now that that veil has been removed, we can um, be in that, be, we can um, be holy and righteous and be in right standing with God through the blood of Jesus and be in that second most holy place with God and have that direct line of communication with him where we don't have to go through, well, we're going through Jesus Christ, but we don't have to, again, atone for those sins and sacrifice animals every year and every day for our sins. Um, so it says that for the gifts, this is in verse nine, it says for the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who, who bring them. And I like this I like this um, verse because it specifically talks about how in the Old Covenant, the only thing the sacrifices were doing was purifying them so that they could be in the presence. It wasn't forgiving sins or clearing your conscience and removing that guilt that you had. Um, it wasn't taking away that shame. It was just cleansing you so that you could be in the presence of God, so that you could be holy in that moment. But um, so then in the next section, it talks about Christ is the perfect sacrifice. Um, and so, well, in verse 10, back up a little bit. So in verse 10, it says, for the old system deals only with food and drink, various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So, you know, things that you could do, but it didn't deal with your in, inner, inner purity. It only dealed with your outer purity. Um, so then it goes into Christ is the perfect sacrifice. Um, so it says in verse... 14, it says, for the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So not only does the blood of Jesus cleanse us outwardly and allow us to be in right standing so that we can actually stand before God, but it also cleans our consciences and cleans us on the inside. It says, under the old system, um, this is in verse 13, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of the heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Um, but it says in verse 14, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. So, you know, there's a big difference between, you know, worship and praise. And worship is just the way that we live. But 
if we are not, if our consciences are not clear, then it is hard to actually worship him in everything that you do. But through the blood of Jesus and through the gifts that he has given us through his sacrifice, the Holy Spirit, we are able to worship him as a living sacrifice and worship him in everything that we do because we are made clean by the act that Jesus did. So then it goes on and it says that, um, it says that in the old covenant, um, so it's talking about how that you had to be in, in order for, okay, so it talks about how a will is in place. It's using a will as an example. So in order for the, um, the covenant to be in effect, it had to be something proof of, of death. Um, so just same with a will, like you can't, um, the will doesn't go into effect until you can prove that the person is actually dead. So you have to have like a death certificate. And so it's the same in the old covenant. It was the animal's blood that sealed the covenant. Um, so it went into a, a, in verse 18, it says, this is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. But now we have the blood of Christ that puts into effect the new covenant that we have with him. And it says um, in verse 24, it says, For Christ did not enter into the holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the one true, the, the, true one in heaven. So Moses had to cover, you know, pretty much all the people and everything in the, in the um, copycat tabernacle here on earth. He had to sprinkle it all with blood to make it pure and holy for God to come down and us to be able to atone for our sins. Um, but Christ enters into the actual true tabernacle in heaven. And that is why much more was needed in order for him to do that. He had to sacrifice himself in order for him to do that and be in heaven to mediate on our behalf and to place us in right standing. And he did that by entering into us so that when God sees us, he's seeing us through the lens of Jesus. So when he looks at us, he's it's like Jesus is in between and he's seeing us through Jesus so that he sees us through that lens of righteousness and it, it absolves everything and um and it says that, um, and just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, so also Christ has offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. And I just think it's so beautiful that now we don't have to um, constantly um you know, atone for our sins over and over and over and over and over again, because we will always be sinners and, until we're in heaven. But the fact that Christ was able to come and do it once and for all time and for everyone. So now, you know, when once we die, we only have to, we enter into that judgment with that salvation already. Um, when we enter into that, we already know the outcome because we believe in, in what Jesus did for us. And that's just such an amazing thing to not have to worry like um you know what if i die before i have a chance to sacrifice an animal on the altar you know will i still be able to go to heaven you know what if i die on the way to the tabernacle to give my offering you know will jesus recognize that i was on my way you know all of that you know we don't have to worry about that we we have that um that confident hope in our future, knowing where we're headed and knowing what Christ did for us and knowing that we can be secure and that full assurance that comes with that. So that is my interpretation of Hebrews chapter nine. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about it. Leave it in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I hope you stay blessed, stay in God's presence and have a great rest of your day. I love you.